Well, welcome back here on Live Now from Fox. And you are taking a live look over the Israel Gaza border, a shot that you have seen a lot over the last nine months. As we do get to the latest developments, they are out of the Middle East. The Israeli military disclosing new findings of an investigation into the deadly massacre on Israel by hundreds of terrorists back on October 7th. The Israel Defense Force is saying the Israeli army failed its mission to protect its citizens, citing disorganization and slow response times to the neighborhoods that were under attack. That is just one of the latest developments out of that area. So I do want to bring in Josh Haston, a Middle East correspondent at the Jewish News Syndicate and spokesperson for the Yesha Council, joining us now live. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. Thanks so much, Josh. All right, so first off, I do want to talk about this probe by the IDF. Can you break down the your thoughts overall on the findings that were released? Yeah, absolutely. We're talking about the community of Be'eri, which is on the Gaza-Israel border, which Hamas infiltrated on October the 7th. And unfortunately, over 100 people were uh, murdered by Hamas and another 11 taken hostage back to Gaza. But one thing that I think is significant is the fact that there were 16 security guards uh, at the community there, and they were able to hold off more than 300 Hamas terrorists. So there is something positive, very brave warriors who held off Hamas. On the other hand, unfortunately, it took the IDF some time to fully mobilize and really get a grasp of the situation in Barry. And that's why over 100 people, 101 to be precise, uh, people, civilians, out of a community of a thousand, so you're talking about one-tenth of the community, was massacred, murdered, raped, burned alive on that day. So this is the first investigation by the IDF. I'm uh, expecting more investigations as we go forward with all the different communities, communities which were infiltrated by Hamas on October the 7th. And then you'll probably have, at the end of the day, a state commission investigating from the top down. I actually heard the defense minister myself yesterday in person talk about the need to investigate on a country level uh, that includes himself and Prime Minister Netanyahu for what happened on that day. So let's recognize the heroism of those who did fight uh, valiantly. And the IDF, let's not make any mistake about it, the IDF was there, but unfortunately the entire country was surprised by what, by what Hamas did on the 7th of October. And talking a little bit more about that possible state commission of inquiry, why might that be necessary? Because we are talking about these different IDF probes in specific neighborhoods, but uh, why would a state, a countrywide investigation be necessary? I think the key here is to make sure October 7th doesn't have, happen again. We have to take a look at what went wrong on that day. Uh, for example, Israel was counting too much on the security barriers surrounding Gaza. And once Hamas penetrated those barriers, they were able to take down the security installations on the various bases along the border. And once they hit that second level and took down those surveillance, uh, uh, those surveillance pieces of equipment, uh, then uh, it was a free-for-all and they were able to attack all the different communities. So we have to have a different concept in terms of how we approach uh, this type of situation, God forbid, in the future. So it has to come from the top down. And again, the defense minister admitting himself that this is something we're going to need. It's going to be on many, many different levels. You already have people who have, unfortunately, had to resign as a result of what happened on October 7th. And Israel investigates itself. Uh, as we do in the midst of a war, we investigate the action of our IDF, and we will do so the day after when we get to that. But most importantly, though, we have to defeat Hamas first. First things first, we defeat Hamas, and then we'll look at what went wrong. One thing that President Biden did mention during his NATO high stakes news conference just last night is that essentially framework to a ceasefire hostage release deal had been approved by Israel as well as Hamas. And I know that initially President Biden had said Israel was all about this deal, but it was really Hamas that they were waiting on uh, to approve some of it. So my question for you is, are we any closer to an actual hostage release ceasefire deal now than we were, let's say, several months ago? Well, on paper, it's definitely top story here in Israel. The fact that we now have negotiators meeting first in uh, Qatar and Doha and then Israeli negotiators meeting in Egypt as well. But that being said, the onus here is on Hamas. And you, you can't trust Hamas. I was thinking the other day, all the way back to 2014, when Israel did go to war against Hamas in Gaza back then. And the second a ceasefire was declared, Hamas still attacked and killed, murdered 
two Israeli soldiers there during a ceasefire. So we have to take it with a grain of salt. And you can't rely on Hamas. You're dealing with a, a maniacal, brutal terrorist organization. So they can be talking about what they want in terms of ceasefire or whatnot. But what Israel has to do is to continue to apply military pressure. As I heard the prime minister say yesterday, we must pressure Hamas. That is the only way. Continue to carry out the necessary military operations. Hamas can no longer be an organized fighting force when all is said and done. And it remains to be seen what will happen actually on the ground in terms of any type of deal, any type of ceasefire. And one thing that I've heard time and time again as these talks have been underway is how exactly do you trust a terrorist organization? So that's something that has to be kept in mind as well, because as you said, there's been these ceasefire deals and they've been broken by Hamas. Now, during the NATO summit, I also want to talk about what Turkey's president had to say. He said that NATO cannot be allowed to continue its partnership with Israel and, quote, attempts at cooperation with Israel within NATO will not be approved by Turkey. Is that significant? Is Turkey's approval needed? Because this all sounds like something that Turkey has been echoing for quite a while. Unfortunately, what we've seen recently is we've seen the Biden administration cower to Turkey. Uh, just several months ago, there was an approval of a $23 billion deal in terms of transferring uh, airplanes, F-16s, I believe, uh, to Turkey from the, from the Biden administration, basically to pay them off in order to allow Sweden into NATO. Turkey was opposed, and then they got this $23 billion deal. And Turkey, we have to remember, they are the gateway to the West. Turkey has threatened uh, Greece time and time again, and essentially Greece is the opening to Europe. So Turkey is a is a strategic uh, importance in all of this. Plus, they are very very close to the Russians. They're close to Erdogan is very close to Vladimir Putin. They are in cahoots together. We're now hearing reports that Turkey wants to mend relations with Syria. So these are major players here in the region. So it doesn't just have to do with Israel; it has to do with the war between Russia and the Ukraine. But we see that Erdogan is pro-Hamas. He supports Hamas. He's been against Israel ever since he was elected. You had the incident of the Gaza flotilla many years ago where terrorists from Turkey tried to infiltrate into Gaza, and then Israel had to do what it had to do and kill those terrorists on that boat, and then Erdogan went crazy. And over the years, Erdogan has turned against Israel at the drop of a pin. He is a pro-Hamas supporter. He supports elements of ISIS, and I don't think he can be trusted but where Turkey is geographically and the fact that they are so close to Russia, I think it's extremely important to monitor the situation uh, in Turkey. And I do want to pop up this live image we have over at the Israel-Lebanon border because I want to talk a little bit more about what's going on in the north here. Have we seen any sort of slowdown of the attacks by Hezbollah in Lebanon on northern Israel? Because I know just days ago you had two civilians that were killed. There's also been some other injuries that have been reported and property damage, some rockets that have uh, fallen in areas, thankfully, that are not populated. But uh, is there any sort of slowdown that we're seeing? I don't think I would call it a slowdown. I mean, we had rockets fired at northern Israel this uh, morning. I mean, perhaps a day or two ago, you were talking about on an hourly basis, rockets, missiles, and drones were being launched at Israel. Maybe it's now every two, three hours or whatnot, but it's still happening. And the fact that 80,000 Israelis can't live in their homes along the northern border, that says, uh, that explains a lot into what the situation and what the reality is over there. You can't, we can't continue like this. We cannot have a border where you don't have residents, where you have nearly continuous on certain days, depending on their mood, Essentially, the other day, Israel took out a top uh, Hezbollah official, and they responded by firing rockets. And as you mentioned, two civilians killed. You can't run a country where you have a terror threat on so many borders. You know, Israel's fighting a war now on seven fronts, and the Hezbollah border is just one of those seven fronts. And it's unacceptable. And Hezbollah, back all the way back in 2006, uh, the U.N. forces were supposed to disarm Hezbollah. That never happened. And by, by the way, we should remember, it all goes back to Iran. Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, these are all Iranian proxies. Uh, Iran is the head of the snake. They're the head of the octopus, sending their tentacles out throughout the Middle East. It cannot be tolerated. And Israelis on the northern border, on the southern border, in Judea and Samaria, Jerusalem, wherever they are, Israelis have the right to live in safety and security. So Israel must take the necessary military action if they continue to fire these rockets and missiles and drones at our people.
We also know that Hezbollah's leadership has essentially said that the attacks on northern Israel would stop if the uh, war there over in Gaza stops. Does anyone really believe that? Is that likely to actually be the case? Or does it appear that Hezbollah could continue to attack Israel regardless? So I heard the statements made by uh, Hassan Nasrallah the other day. And again, you have to take these with a grain of salt. You're talking about a maniacal uh, terrorist organization willing to sacrifice mm -hmm. its own population in order to destroy Israel. So with a grain of salt, it is very possible there could be a lull if some sort of ceasefire deal is reached with Hamas. But for how long? I mean, Hamas broke ceasefire deals, I think, five, at least five different times and launched major military operations against Israel. Hezbollah is even more armed to the teeth. You're talking about over 100,000, if not more, rockets and missiles and drones aimed at Israel. you got to take it with a grain of salt. These are evil people, and uh, we expect people around the world to understand the difference between light and darkness, good and evil, and Israel's on the side of good here. So we can't count on Hezbollah. Their word means absolutely nothing to me. Josh Haston, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and break that down. Obviously, a lot of topics that we did discuss there. Is there anything else you want to add about any of this before I let you go? I just want to say, again, I, I heard the prime minister myself yesterday, and he is determined to uphold the three goals of the war in Gaza. Number one, uh, dismantling Hamas's military capability. Number two, the return of the hostages through military force. He believes strongly that we must continue to put pressure on Hamas. That's why they're even willing to come to the negotiating table is because of the military pressure we put on Hamas. And number three, we have to ensure that Gaza is no longer a threat to the state of Israel. So those three goals of the war still remain in play today, nine months later, and hopefully those, though all those three goals will be fulfilled and, Hus and Hamas would be dismantled, not just for the sake of Israel, but the sake for the sake of Western humanity, for the sake of the Western world. They call Israel the little Satan. They call you over there, the United States, the great Satan. Again, all from Iran. They're, they're calling the shots here. So we have to keep that in mind. Hamas must be destroyed. All right, Josh, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you.